Time Tales presents 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea A film strip flashback Enjoy the show 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne The author of this long popular book is hailed by many authorities as the creator of science fiction for the impact of his fantastic novels spread throughout the world and influenced the work of such later masters in the field as H.G. Wells and H. Ryder Haggard. By age 35, Jules Verne's reputation was made because his great success, Five Weeks in a Balloon, won him a 20-year contract to produce two novels a year. This resulted in such well-remembered works as Around the World in 80 Days, Voyage to the Center of the Earth, From the Earth to the Moon, and of course, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was published in 1870 when he was 42 years old. Imagine, a century ago, Jules Verne, through Captain Nemo, prophesied the development of the submarine and other inventions that at the time seemed incredible, but which have since become realities. According to the story, in 1867, a mysterious monster roamed the sea. It had been spotted by ships traveling in every ocean and the seven seas as well. Reports said it was a long, spindle-shaped object that sometimes shone mysteriously and was much larger and faster than any whale. For well over a year, this monster had attacked and sunk several vessels. People everywhere were alarmed. What deep sea life form could destroy ships by ramming them? Although there was much speculation, no one could say positively what kind of creature could pierce one and a half inches of steel. Because it was too risky to venture aboard a ship, ocean travel declined rapidly, and the world's leading marine insurance companies, including Lloyd's of London, were on the verge of drastically increasing their rates. Finally, a United States freighter was sent to destroy the mysterious sea creature. When the freighter, the USS Abraham Lincoln, had set sail from New York Harbor in June 1867 under the command of an experienced seaman named Farragut, it carried every conceivable type of weapon and instrument that might be needed during its journey. On the freighter were Pierre Aronnax, a French scientist, his servant, Conseil, and Ned Land, a harpooner. Professor Aronnax had been in America gathering fossils in the Nebraska Badlands for the Paris Museum of Natural History with his servant, who doubled as a scientific assistant. They were on their way home to France when the invitation came from the U.S. Navy Department to go on the Lincoln's voyage. Ned Land, a tall, quiet man of about 40, was from Canada and was considered the very best whale hunter and harpooner in North America. For three months, the Lincoln sailed through the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, searching for the sea monster with no luck. At last, Commander Farragut decided to return to America. But three days later, the freighter sighted the monster and attacked it. Professor Aronnax believed the thing to be a narwhal, a creature resembling the whale, but much more deadly. A great cannon was fired directly at the monster. Much to everyone's horror, the cannonball merely bounced off the creature's back and landed two miles away in the water. Then, Ned Land threw his harpoon, but the monster seemed to be protected by a thick steel-like armor. Commander Farragut was bewildered, but he vowed to pursue the beast until my ship blows up. Immediately, he ordered more speed from his engines. All night, the Lincoln strained every seam in its tremendous effort to catch the monster. It could not keep it up much longer. Then, when the creature was still about three miles off, it ceased running and lay still on top of the water. Commander Farragut cut his speed quickly and cautiously approached the sleeping monster. No one dared breathe. They were within a hundred feet of the dazzling electric light that shone from its eyes. Ned Land threw his harpoon once more, and suddenly, a terrific explosion shook the freighter. The electric light died out as two enormous water spouts broke over the ship, flooding it from stem to stern, knocking men down, breaking the lashing of the spars. The sails kept for use in emergencies swung loose and the masts began to crack. Amidst all the confusion, 
Aronnax, Conseil, and Land were thrown into the sea. When the professor rose to the surface, he discovered to his horror that the Lincoln had continued on its way. Apparently, no one on board realized that they had fallen overboard. A moment later, Conseil joined him, and still later, Ned Land swam over to them as they struggled against exhaustion and despair. Their plight seemed hopeless, but Ned Land had news for them. When he had been thrown overboard, he had landed on the monster, which still rocked on top of the water nearby. With their last ounce of strength, they found refuge on the back of the monster. It was made of sheet iron. Clearly, this was no ocean creature, but a man-made creation of destruction. As they clung weakly to the back of the machine, a strange noise started inside, and suddenly they began to submerge. Out of fear, they rapped on the metal. At last, a hatch opened, and eight tall men, their faces masked, came out without saying a word and dragged them inside. In this startling fashion, the three men were taken aboard the monster, which turned out to be the submarine Nautilus. They were put into a small but comfortable chamber, where they were fed a marvelous dinner of unknown foods. Afterwards, they fell asleep and did not awaken until the following day. It was then that they met their host. The captain of this strange boat, propelled by electricity, was Captain Nemo. Although the name Nemo means nobody in Latin, the man himself was an extraordinary person. In French, Nemo told the men that they were prisoners, but would be allowed every liberty while aboard. However, they might never leave it, Nemo warned them, for they had already learned too much of his secret and must never be allowed to reveal it to the world. For the most part, they would be free to wander about the submarine to enjoy its vast library, its museum, and other diversions. However, on special occasions, they would be required to retire to their cabins. Ned Land was indignant at this enforced imprisonment, but Professor Aronnax became more and more intrigued by Captain Nemo, his ship, and the opportunity to explore the ocean depths as no other scientist in history had ever done. On a tour of the submarine, Aronnax discovered that the Nautilus manufactured its own electricity. Nemo explained that the ocean waters were rich in every kind of chemical, and that his machines were made to extract sodium from the seawater. The sodium, mixed with mercury, took the place of zinc in normal electric batteries and provided an electric force twice as powerful as the batteries then in use throughout the world. By questioning Nemo, he also learned that there was enough oxygen to keep the submarine submerged for long periods. The air was stored in huge tanks under pressure and regularly pumped throughout the ship, replenishing and refreshing the stale air. As Nemo proudly took the professor all over his ship, they passed through an art gallery that contained many famous masterpieces. Next, they entered a large, beautifully furnished library that contained over 12,000 volumes in many languages, and Nemo was fluent in all of them. From there, they visited Nemo's undersea museum, which contained hundreds of specimens of rare fish and sea life worth millions of dollars in any civilized nation. The professor was even more amazed when he learned that all the food for the crew came from the ocean. There were no complaints, because since they had abandoned life on land, to live on the Nautilus. Their health had improved. Besides, Captain Nemo had a great chef aboard who could prepare the most delicious meals the professor had ever eaten. Indeed, there seemed to be no limit to Nemo's resourcefulness. Clothing for the crew was made from some sort of sea fibers or shellfish tissue. The mattresses were made from seaweed. Pens were made of whalebone. Sugar was made of rockweed and cream from whale's milk. Even cigars were supplied by the sea from a seaweed rich in nicotine. As Nemo took the professor still deeper into the submarine, he began to talk about underwater hunting expeditions where his crew used special gear that permitted them to walk on the ocean floor. Along with this, Captain Nemo showed Aronnax air guns which the crew used in hunting. The guns used air under great pressure to propel bullets which exploded on contact. Finally, Nemo showed the professor his own cabin, which was large and elegantly furnished. There they finished their conversation on a more personal note. Nemo told the professor 
that he hated mankind and the tyranny of the great nation. That was why he had built his remarkable ship and had never set foot on land from the time it was launched. But when Aronnax tried to find out who Nemo really was and where he had come from, the captain abruptly closed the conversation. Later, Nemo and his three passengers went on a hunting trip in a marine forest beneath the barren little island of St. Grespo in the North Pacific. All the men wore the specially designed oxygen-carrying suits, which could supply them with air for nine or ten hours. Nemo killed a large, rare sea otter, and then aiming straight up through the clear water, brought down a huge albatross. As the group started back to the Nautilus, Ned Land saved Nemo's life by killing a gigantic shark which attacked him. Fortunately for the captain, Ned had disdained the use of the strange air guns and had brought along a good harpoon instead. With all hands safe, the Nautilus continued on its way out of the Pacific into the Indian Ocean, where they cruised about. In Ceylon, Aronnax and the crew watched pearl divers among oyster beds. These courageous men dived with a rope around their bodies. At one end, they tied a heavy stone, while the other end was tied to their boats on the surface. Since they could only stay down 30 seconds at a time, they used the stone to reach bottom faster. One poor man dove again and again, frantically cutting the oysters loose from their beds before surfacing with bursting lungs. Nemo said that most of these men did not live long, and they were paid one cent for each oyster they brought up which had a pearl in it. He said this bitterly, for he explained the pearls were worth thousands of dollars, and these men were cutting their lives short to enrich the despots and tyrants of the world. As he spoke, a shark attacked one of the divers. Nemo himself left the submarine and armed only with a dagger, killed the shark. Then he cut the rope that held the man to the stone, lifted him up in his arms, and carried him back to his boat unharmed. From his diving suit, Nemo pulled a bag of pearls and put them in the poor man's trembling hand. Later, when Aronnax praised him for his kindness, Nemo said fiercely, that Indian professor lives in the land of the oppressed. I am from that country. After that incident, the Nautilus continued on its way, sometimes traveling as much as two or 300 miles in a day. Months passed, and they found themselves near the coast of Borneo. Because his guests longed for fresh meat, Nemo allowed them to go ashore. But while hunting in Borneo, Aronnax and his companions were attacked by natives. Somehow, the three men managed to get back to the Nautilus while the natives piled into war canoes and hastened in pursuit. Within a few minutes, the savages clustered about the submarine, which was on the surface replenishing its supply of fresh air. Nemo ordered the iron hatches closed to prevent them from boarding the ship. But as the natives returned the next day, Captain Nemo opened the hatch. Aronnax, who did not understand why he seemed to be inviting attack, begged him to close it quickly. But Nemo told him to watch and wait. As he had expected, the savages, touching the rail to come aboard, shrieked and fled. In their terror, they overturned the canoes. Still crying out, they swam for land, afraid to look back. Puzzled, Ned Land touched the rail and was paralyzed with shock. The rail was electrified, but the electricity the natives had received was just enough to frighten them off without seriously injuring or killing any of them. Soon the ship submerged. Aronnax realized that Ned and Conseil were unhappy and longed to be home. So although he would have been content to remain with Nemo for the rest of his days, Aronnax and Ned Land discussed plans of escape. They were not successful. Still, he continued to think about escape because he had a nagging feeling that something was going to happen to Nemo and his ship. One attempt to escape failed when a sudden hurricane blew the submarine off its course. Then one day, the three companions were drugged and put in their cabins. No explanations were made at the time, but Aronnax later discovered that Nemo had attacked another ship while they had been asleep. Despite his sympathy for Nemo, he could not condone such inhuman actions. The professor's premonition of danger grew when the Nautilus nearing the South Pole was endangered by an iceberg. They almost suffocated below the polar ice cap, hemmed in on both sides by huge cliffs of underwater ice. 
Escaping from the iceberg, the Nautilus was drawn into a whirlpool. It seemed that Nemo had deliberately headed for the whirlpool. The three passengers were shocked by these events, especially since Nemo had become gloomy and morose after sighting a man of war whose nationality he alone knew. In a rage, he attacked the ship, sinking it with all aboard. Afterwards, he told Aranax that another ship of that nation had destroyed his wife and two small children. The professor was not sympathetic. Instead, he despised Nemo for taking such bloody revenge upon innocent people. With the ship floundering in the whirlpool, no one paid attention to Aranax, Conseil, and Ned as they made their way to an extra boat that was bolted to the submarine. In this way, Aronax and his companions escaped from the submarine and were rescued by Norwegian fishermen. That was the last anyone ever saw of the Nautilus or its captain. Later, Aronax returned to Paris. There he told his story to friends who could hardly believe his tale. Often he wondered if the powerful ship had conquered the whirlpool and if Captain Nemo had at last had enough of hatred, vengeance, and murder. Perhaps he was still out there in his hidden kingdom, peacefully resigned to fate's blows, content to explore the underworld wilderness. The End Hey folks, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. We hope you enjoyed the show. Cheers.